If you would take your Bibles and turn with me to the book of James, James chapter 1. James chapter 1, we are continuing our series of messages that we've entitled Refocus. We are spending the month of February and some of March refocusing on uh, what God has called us to do, looking to Christ, the author and finisher of our faith, and and being challenged in our walk this new year, 2020. I, I know that it's weird to hear about new year in late February, but did you realize that many of us made New Year's resolutions only seven weeks ago? I'm not going to ask for a show of hands of how many people are actually still following those resolutions. Statistics hold true. Nearly 90% of us have already thrown the scales out. We're already eating Oreos again, and that gym membership, it, it ended three or four weeks ago. But a lot of us, we made resolutions in our life to be more spiritual, to follow God closer. And and the reason why we added this series of messages, not in January, but February, was to cause us to refocus again, to remind us of the commitment that we made, not only in January to be closer followers of Jesus, but but our commitment of our life, that, that our desire of life is to be closer and closer to Jesus. And so that's what we're doing through this series of messages. A few weeks ago, we we began by talking about removing sin and removing weights that that hinder us. Two weeks ago, the last time I was here with you, we talked about renewing our mind. Today, we're going to be looking at James chapter 1 and talking about receiving the word. All of these sermons in this series are meant to be practical sermon application series for us to be able to receive from God's word to help us to to fulfill that desire in our heart and that life to be closer followers of Jesus, to, to, to walk with Jesus closer, to see him clear, and to be better followers of him. It's our custom to stand in the honor of reading God's word, so if you would stand, James chapter 1, we'll begin reading in verse number 18. He says, of his own will, he brought us forth by the word of truth, that we might be a kind of first fruits of his creatures. So then, my beloved brethren, let everyone, let every man be swift to hear, slow to speak, slow to wrath, for the wrath of man does not produce the righteousness of God. Therefore, lay aside all filthiness and overflow of wickedness, and receive with meekness the implanted word which is able to save your souls. But be doers of the word and not hearers only, deceiving yourselves. For if anyone is a hearer of the word and not a doer, he is like a man observing his natural face in a mirror. For he observes himself, goes away, and immediately forgets what kind of man he was. But he who looks into the perfect law of liberty and continues in it, and is not a forgetful hearer, but a doer of the work, this one will be blessed in what he does. Father, we thank you for this powerful word. Now, God, as we talk about renewing ourselves, receiving the word, Father, may you speak to us from your word, we pray in Christ's name. And all of God's people said amen. Please be seated. If you have your church app open, you see what point number one already is. If you've not yet downloaded the church app, let me share with you what point number one is. Number one, the word of God leads me to humble myself before God. That's the first thing that we see here in James. As we talk about receiving the word, what does the word do? If I'm trying to refocus on Christ, what am I to do? How am I to allow the word of God to come into my life to to, to follow Jesus more closely? Well, we understand that the word of God humbles me and it allows me to humble myself before God. To say this another way, we focus on Jesus through the word when we walk in humility. Humility is not thinking of myself less. It's, thinking, it's not thinking less of myself, but it's thinking of myself less. Humility is the opposite of pride. Pride says, I want what I want when I want it. And every one of us struggle with pride, but you see, pride is antithetical to humility. I cannot focus on Jesus. I cannot draw closer to Jesus as long as there is pride in my heart, as long as there is pride in my life. You see, it was pride that was the sin of Lucifer. It was pride that was the sin in the garden. And at the root of my sin and at the root of your sin is the sin of pride. And James warns us in verse 21, he says, lay aside all sin and unfilthiness, lay aside that pride. All this garbage of the world, lay it off. He he literally says, take it off and stop walking in it. 
We talked about this a few weeks ago in Ephesians chapter 4, of taking off the, the old man, taking off the flesh, and putting on the new man, putting on Jesus Christ, walking in Jesus and we discovered a truth that I left you hanging on a couple of weeks ago when, when we said that the way we renew our mind is by receiving the word. Now, I didn't tell you then what it meant to receive the word because I knew this sermon was coming. So the way we renew our mind by receiving the word, James tells us how we approach the word, how we do that, how we allow our mind to be renewed in the word of God. Verse 19, he says, be swift to hear. Be slow to speak and slow to wrath. How many times do we come to the word of God being swift to speak and slow to hear? How many times do we come to God telling God, coming to God with, with, with his word in hand, having our minds made up what is best for us already? God, I know that you don't know what's going on, so let me tell you what's going on. Let me tell you what you need to do about it, God. Telling God what to do. T taking, taking verses out of context and, 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 and using them as some sort of good luck charm. And waving a verse in, in front of what's going on in my life as, this, as if that's going to keep the bad away. <laughs> no, that's not how you handle the word of God. That's not Christianity. That's not how we apply the word of God to our lives. The word of God, the scripture, the Bible is meant to speak to our hearts and speak to our lives. And it reminds us that no matter what we face, we serve a God who is love. We serve a God who is in control. We serve a God who is good. It's not that God is going to keep bad things from happening, hurtful things from happening. That's part of life, friend. Bad things, hurtful things, harmful things are going to happen in your life. And that's why we have the word. Because the word doesn't ward those things off. No, the word of God reminds me that no matter what I face, I serve a God who is bigger than whatever I face. I serve a God who is more powerful than what I face. I serve a God who is over what I face. And in the end, we win. In the end, even if this thing takes my life, you know what? It can't take my eternity because the Bible says greater is he who is within me than he who is in the world. Receive the word. He says, receive the word. Be quick to hear it. Be slow to speak. And then he says, be slow to wrath. What do you think of when you hear the word wrath? Uh, I, I think of, of being vengeful, blowing up, being red-faced, and, 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 and yelling and screaming, uh, being a spectacle for all people to see. But the word wrath here does not mean that. It's not an outward blow-up, it's an inward burning. Wrath is not an outward burning or an outward blow-up, it's an, an inward burning. It's not a burning without, it's a burning within. And notice what James says about the wrath of man in verse 20. He says, the wrath of man does not produce the righteousness of God. Now let me back up, because I don't want to assume that we all understand what that word righteousness means. We, the word righteous, righteousness simply means being right and, and in right standing with God. It means that when holy God, sinless God, perfect God, looks at me, a sinful human being, it, it means that God looks at me and he says, you're okay. That's righteousness of God. Righteousness of God is when holy God looks at unholy me and says, you're okay. I'm okay with you. Now, understand that everyone in this world believes they're righteous. Everybody believes that they're good, that they're okay. If you don't believe me, just ask somebody, hey, are you a good person? Very rarely will you find somebody who says, yeah, I'm, I'm a pretty despicable human being. But when we look at the law of God, when we look at the word of God, when we open up the word and we allow the word to share with us who we truly are, when we compare ourselves with God, what does the Bible say about us? We're not good at all. 
If you take the Ten Commandments, we understand, have, have you ever lied before? Even if it's a little white lie? If you said no, then you're lying. If you lie, what does that make you? A liar. Have you ever stolen something, taken something that didn't belong to you, even if it was a pencil when you were a kid? What does that make you? A thief. So by your own admission, you're a lying thief. The Bible says that if you look after a woman in your heart and lust after her, you've committed adultery. Have you ever lusted before? So by your own admission, you're a lying thief, adulterer at heart. Have you ever hated? Jesus said if you've hated a man in your heart, you've killed him. You've committed murder. I know you have because you're human. So by your own admission, you are a lying, thieving, adulterous murderer at heart. And I am too. Now, if we were to stand before God on Judgment Day, understand, and we're, we're not going to go any further because this, this, I, I don't want us to be so hard. Well, let's just stop at four. Let's not go all ten, okay? Stop at four. So by our own admission, we are lying, thieving, adulterous murderers at heart, standing before God at Judgment Day, God who is holy, God who does not allow sin into his heaven. Are we going to be found innocent or are we going to be found guilty? We're guilty. Every one of us is guilty of sin. You see, in our own righteousness, we think we're good. We're, we're, we're okay. We're not as bad as that person. And maybe my goodness will somehow equate to God allowing me into his heaven, but, but my righteousness doesn't mean anything. Paul says in Philippians chapter 3, verse 8, he says, Yet indeed I also count all things lost for the excellence of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things, and count them as rubbish that I may gain Christ. All the good things I have done, Paul says, I count as rubbish, so that, verse 9, and be found in him, not having my own righteousness, you see, we, we all think we're righteous. We all think that we're good. We all think we have right standing with God, not, not in my own righteousness, which is from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ. The righteousness which comes from God through faith. You see, there's two different kinds of righteousness. There's the righteousness of man, and there's the righteousness of God that comes in Christ. Which one is God going to look at and say, that now that you have that righteousness, I'm okay with you? Your own righteousness or his righteousness? You see, in our own righteousness, our own righteousness, according to the law, we are guilty so being right with God is not based off of my own work or my own doing. It comes through faith. He said this twice in that verse, in verse 9. He says it's through faith and by faith. In whom? In Christ. You see, Jesus Christ is our righteousness. Jesus Christ is how we can stand before God innocent, how God can look at us and say, I'm okay with you. You're right with me. How is that possible? Only through Jesus Christ. The only way for holy God to look at me, sinful human, and no longer see my sin and hold my sin against me is that when he sees not me, but he sees Christ. He sees Christ. He sees a son. 2 Corinthians 5, 21, God made him who knew no sin to be sin for us that we might become the righteousness of God in him. There's our word righteousness again. The way we become righteous with God, the way we have right standing with God, the way God is okay with us is when we come under Christ Jesus. He no longer sees my righteousness, which is sinful. But when I'm in Christ he sees the righteousness of Jesus. This is why James says in verse 21, lay aside all filthiness and the overflow of wickedness and do what? He says, receive in meekness. There's our word humility. Lay aside the sin which so easily ensnares us and put on humility, put on meekness through the implanted word. Why the word? Because the word sheds light. The Bible says the word is a lamp unto my feet, a light unto my path. The word, when I open the word of God, the word of God sheds light on my pride. It brings conviction. 
It shows me where I have fallen. It shows me when I'm walking in my righteousness and not his righteousness. This is important. You see, I cannot focus on Jesus and draw closer to Jesus. Christian, listen to me. I cannot, you cannot go closer to Jesus if you are operating in your own righteousness. If you're operating in that dead flesh, you can't do it. This is why we come to the Word, and the Word of God shows me where I have messed up. It shows me where I've sinned. It shows me where I'm falling short, and it calls me to repentance. It calls me to humility. Second thing it does, the Word of God leads me to know that I belong to God. You see, I I begin to have my own righteousness and walk in my own righteousness and focus on myself, but, but, but my focus on myself happens when I lose sight of God. When I believe that I belong to myself, every Christian that's here, listen up. You are not your own. You don't belong to yourself. You were bought with a price. I refocus on Christ when I I remember I belong to him. What does he mean when he says receive with meekness the implanted word? The implanted word. What what does that mean? How does a book, how does the word of God get planted in our heart, which is able, according to James, which is able to save your soul? Well, let's back up. How are we saved? We're saved by grace through faith, right? But where does faith originate from? Paul tells us in Romans chapter 10, verse 17, so faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God. How are you saved? If you're saved, how did that happen? Where did that happen? You see, none of us have the same story. That's the beautiful thing about salvation. None of us have the same story. If you're saved here today, how many of you were saved in a church service? How many of you were saved at a home? How many of you were saved at the beach? How many of you were saved on an airplane? You see, none of us have the same story. All of us us have a different story. Some of us were saved in revivals. Some of us were saved at the beach. Some of us were saved at church. Everybody's story is different, but there is something that unites all of our stories. You know what it is? The message that we heard, the message that we received, the message that we believed in. Whether it it was parents that shared with us, an evangelist, a pastor, no matter who it was that shared Christ with us, whoever told you about Jesus had to share with you the truth about Jesus. You had to hear that you're a sinner, that your sin separated you from holy God, yet God sent his son into this world to, to become sin, to take your place, so that when you place your faith as you hear the word, When you place your faith and trust in him, you're saved. This is what Paul says in Ephesians 1.13. He says, in him you also trusted after you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, and having believed, you were sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise. Now I want you to notice something here. He says, in whom or in him you also trusted after you what? After you heard, you heard what? The word of truth. So the word of truth, the the gospel that Christ died for you was buried and rose again, that must be declared. And so you heard the word. You heard the greatest news that has ever been said. You, You heard the word. And then what did you do? It was the gospel of your salvation, having what? Believed. You see, faith cometh by hearing, hearing by the word of God. What unites all of us, all of our stories are different, but what unites us is that we all heard the same word, the gospel. And when we heard the word, faith can be produced because faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God. And so when the word of God was shared over us, conviction fell upon us. And when conviction fell upon us, we believed. And then after we were believed, we were sealed. We received the Holy Spirit. You see, we heard, we believed, and we received. We heard, we believed, we received. We heard, we believed, and we received. The, the implanted word, if you look back at Luke, uh, James chapter 1, verse 21, he says, and receive with meekness the implanted word. The implanted word, the gospel. 
what you receive is the promised Holy Spirit when you're saved. You heard the word. You believed the word. You received the word. And who you received is the promised Holy Spirit. This is foretold in the book of Ezekiel. Ezekiel declares in Ezekiel chapter 36, verse 25, God says, hundreds of years, hundreds of years before the coming of Christ, he said, then I will sprinkle clean water on you and you shall be clean. I will cleanse you from all your filthiness and all your idols. I will give you a new heart and put in you a new spirit within you. I will take the heart of stone out of your flesh. Get the picture, take it out and put it on, take it off and put it on, take it off and put it on. I will take the stone of flesh out of you and I will give you a heart of flesh. I will put my spirit within you and cause you to walk on my statutes and you will keep my judgments and do them. You see, when a believer, when a follower of Jesus Christ is walking with God, not walking in the flesh, not walking in sin, but walking with God, would you read the word? When, when you come to the scripture and you read the word, the implanted word, the, the Holy Spirit who lives inside of you agrees with what you're reading and faith grows. This is why Paul says in 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 14, that to the natural man, the things of God doesn't make sense. The natural man, would you, a lost person comes to the Bible and says, I don't understand this. Why? Because the implanted word does not live in them. When the Holy Spirit lives in you and you come to the word of God, now the word of God, the, the written word speaks to the implanted word and now there's an agreement here and I can say that despite what's coming along that, that no matter what I face, I know that I belong to God because within me this faith is growing and I know it doesn't make any sense but I know, God, you are going to take care of me. Romans 8, 16, the Spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God. I found that a major struggle with a lot of Christians today is that you struggle with your salvation. If you've invited Christ into your life and he's your Lord and Savior, you're repentant of sin and invite him in your life, you are saved and you can't lose that salvation. If you go back to Ephesians chapter 1, verse 13, it says that you were sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise. Who is your deposit? Who is your guarantee until you acquire possession of it? You cannot, you cannot be cast out of the family of God once you've been born again. You can't lose it. If God saved you, he placed his word in you, his spirit in you, you are saved. We're reminded that, that we do not belong to ourselves, but, but, but we are called to a higher calling, which leads me to this As a Christian, I should not operate as lost people do. Lost people operate to serve themselves. But as a follower of Jesus, the way I refocus on Jesus, I I remember that I, I must walk in humility. I remember that I belong to him, not myself, which leads me, number three, to serve God. The word leads me to serve God. James said this in verse 22. He said, but be doers of the word and not hearers only. Why? Because verse 23, he's like a man observing his natural face in a mirror. He who observes himself goes away and immediately forgets what kind of man he was. In other words, if you look at the word and you don't allow the word to penetrate your heart, there's no effect on your life. And James qualifies this in verses 26 and 27. He gives us two examples of what, how we are to serve God. He said, if anyone among you thinks he's religious and does not bridle his tongue but deceives his own heart, that man's religion is useless. Pure and undefiled religion before God and the Father is this, to visit orphans and widows in their trouble and to keep oneself unspotted from the world. Religion, we, we, if you grew up in church, you probably heard that, that religion's a bad thing. Religion is not a bad thing. All religion is is a set of beliefs. Religion cannot save you, but what religion does, religion is a product of salvation. If you are saved, then you should be working. If you are saved, you should be doing And here in our text, we're told that pure and undefiled religion is this, that we take care of widows, we take care of orphans. Religion doesn't save us, but those who are saved demonstrate their salvation by religion. In other words, let me say it the way James said it. You show me your faith, and I'll show you my faith with my works. You see, the church is called to serve others. This is how we refocus on Christ. We stop focusing on self, we focus on Christ, and the way we focus on Christ is we begin to focus on others. We begin to serve other people. We get outside of our own selves and we begin to give ourselves to others, 
to meet others' needs, to love them as Christ loves them. And here at this church, there are so many opportunities. I see Rick Stevens back here who serves faithfully in our, our bike ministry where we, we, we receive old bikes and we renew bikes and we give them out to people who need bikes. What a great opportunity, a great ministry to be able to pour into people. I see others here who are part of our Steps to Freedom every Tuesday night. What an opportunity to help people walk through the steps to find freedom in Christ. We have a widow ministry, a single mom ministry, a kids ministry, student ministry, life group ministry. We have Good News Clubhouse that meets at uh, just an elementary school not too far from here. And we're seeing children give their life to Jesus, but we don't have enough workers. In a church this size, we should never be needing volunteers for anything. That was a good place for an amen. <laughs> you see, the word of God leads me to serve. And number four, the word leads me to a blessing from God. God tells me that being in his word and serving him through his word, it brings a blessing. Verse 25, but he who looks into the perfect law of liberty continues in it and is not forgetful here, but a doer of the work. This one will be blessed in what he does. Christian, would you hide the word of God in your heart and you serve him, the Bible says you'll be blessed. This is not the only time in the Bible that we're told that when we hide the word of God in our heart that we'll be blessed. Joshua 1a says, the book of the law shall not depart from your mouth, but you will meditate on it day and night so that you are careful to observe everything that's in it. For then you will make your way prosperous and you will have good success. I challenge you this day to, to spend time daily in the word of God. Memorize the scripture, hide the word of God in your heart and, and allow the word of God to speak over you to not stand in your righteousness but the righteousness of Christ and also step outside of maybe even your comfort zone and use the gifts he's given you to serve the church, to serve others, to love and to point others to him. God will speak to you from his word and through his word. 2 Timothy 3.16, all scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, reproof, correction, and instruction. Here's a word again, in righteousness. You see, the scripture helps us to, to see clearly who we are and who we need to be, how we stand before God. My life, your life, Christian, is to be a testimony and point others to Jesus. My desire should be to be more like Jesus every single day. And how does that happen? When I submit myself to the word, when I renew my mind in the word, when I receive with meekness the implanted word in my life, and I don't just be a hearer, but I'm a doer of that word as well. Can I challenge all of us today? If you have long forgotten even what your New Year's resolution was, maybe you've forgotten what it is, recommit to Christ this day to be a better follower of Jesus. That's, that's a good thing to recommit every single day to Christ. God, help me today to be more like Jesus. Help me today. If you've not been in the word already today, Go home, open the Bible, and get in the Word. Commit yourself this week. Open the Bible every morning and spend time in the Word. I shared with you earlier the Psalm of the day. Today's Psalm 23. Tomorrow, guess where you're going to be? Psalm 24. It's not hard. Spend time with God in his word every single week and, and allow the word of God to speak to your heart. Grow that relationship with him. If you're not saved you need to be saved today. The Bible says today is the day of salvation. God desires a relationship with you, so come into a relationship with him today. If you are saved, and this message really was for those of us who are saved today, why don't you receive the word of God with meekness, the implanted word that's in your heart? Don't live in your own righteousness, but live in the righteousness of Christ, and God will use you. Will you bow your heads with me? Heads bowed and eyes closed across this room here today. If you're here and you need to be saved, we invite you to come forward. In just a moment, we'll have a minister at the front of each of these aisles. If you already know Christ, why don't you slip out and come? Because I know there's times in life when we stand and we walk in our own righteousness. Maybe God has convicted you and you need to come and kneel and say, God, forgive me.
forgive me for I am a sinner. Maybe you just want to stay right where you are when everybody else stands and sings. You just stay seated. Just repent of that sin. The beauty of our God, the beauty of our God is that he will forgive you of that. Refocus on him today. Don't run after the lust of the flesh, but run after the things of God.